Hello, this is William from Allegory Gallery, and we're here today for this episode of Allegory Gallery Interviews with our Ligonier Art Walk artist, Jen Palmer. Today, we are also joined by the creative director of Allegory Gallery, Andrew Thornton. So welcome, Jen and Andrew. Hello. Hi. We would like to mention first that Jen's art can be found on her website at jenpalmer.myportfolio.com. That's J-E-N-P-A-L-M-E-R dot myportfolio.com. You can see her latest artwork there, and she will also be here in Ligonier during the Ligonier Art Walk Fall 2018 event. Her physical show will be up until November 16th, 2018 here at Allegory Gallery, and as a special bonus, we'll be adding additional pieces to her online show on our website that won't be seen in store. So, welcome. Thank you. How's everything going today? Good. Good. So what we'd like to start out with is, um, why don't you just tell for our audience a little bit more about yourself, where you come from? I am from a small town beyond Ligonier. Um, I grew up there, went to high school there, um, and now I live in Latrobe, so I'm not very far at all. Okay, yeah. Great. So how do you think that affected you when you were thinking about going to school and uh, becoming a creative professional? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I was starving for art. It was like, <laughs> it was practically Growing non- up here. I get that. Yeah. Practically mm-hmm. non-existent. And I remember I had to like petition the high school to let me take more art classes. Cause I knew since I was like little that I wanted to be an artist. And then mm-hmm. I get to high school and I'm like, what do you mean I can't take another art class? <laughs> and so I like, they had to let me take elective art like every quarter and I think my mom had to like sign something to make sure that that was okay. But yeah, it, um, there wasn't much access to anything. Like if I could go to, um, you know, like an arts and crafts festival locally, like that was amazing to me. And I, like, I remember going to, um, the Westmoreland Twin Lakes, they have that festival every year. Mm-hmm. And I went to that since I was little and to Fort Days and Ligonier and just seeing the crafts people and people with their paintings and photographs. It was, it was amazing. And I knew that that's what like I had to, had to make stuff <laughs> um, my whole life, but it wasn't available. You know, I didn't have much exposure. And right. so it was a big shock getting to art school you know, being, being a good artist at United is like (laughs) nothing. (laughs) Sorry, United. (laughs) Um, it's just, you, you go to a school with people that have parents who are artists who have grown up in a city who have had exposure to major museums. Mm -hmm. Um, and they just know so much more. They're so far ahead of you. Uh, so it was a not really prepared, I guess, growing up in this area to to enter. So tell us a little bit about your schooling. Um, I went to Columbus College of Art and Design for about three and a half years. Um, I did my foundation studies there, and um, and then I was studying fashion design. Uh, I loved surface, all the patterns, the the line, the color, which is pretty evident now, I think. That I, that no, it's no surprise that I love that stuff. As people will see when they come to see your show. Yeah, I... Um, I really loved that, but I started to have trouble with my hands. Uh, I was in a lot of pain and I was doing stuff like, like I remember walking to my painting class when I was in Columbus and I just fell down. I just couldn't like carry my body and my paint box, which, you know, paint boxes are heavy, but they're not that heavy. And I just was so tired and I was stumbling and I would go back to my dorm and take a nap at any point that I could. Mm -hmm. Um, so I knew something was going on, um, and I would come home over breaks and like see the see all my doctors back home, and you know nobody could figure out anything that was wrong with me. But clearly, I wasn't feeling well. Right. Um, so I got into it was illustration classes. I think in my third year, so I was actually majoring in fashion design. You know, um, doing pattern and and making garments, and um, the illustration part was the part that I had to use my hands for. And it was a very intense program. And I worked so hard and I remember just crying and crying because I had turned in this project and I'm like, always had to get A's on everything. Like that was expected of me. And I, I get it. And like, <laughs> and I'm, so I'm, you know, working really hard and I put everything I had into it, but my body wouldn't physically do what I needed it to. 
And so I remember getting a D on that project because I had to turn it in. It was right. like, I couldn't work on it anymore. I couldn't stay awake anymore. I, um, my now husband, I remember he wouldn't let me drive because I was so tired that he would take me to my classes and, oh, wow. and just to get me through that finals week. And, um, I wanted to take off the next semester, but my mom was afraid I would never go back. And so we had a big discussion about, mm-hmm. about taking time off to figure out what I wanted to do and not. Um, so I stayed at Columbus College of Art and Design. I took a semester of just like random classes. I took some stuff in fashion that I liked. I took, um, some art history and I ended up taking, a photography class there and because I knew that I loved that and then I also found an art therapy class and I was like what is this <laughs> why don't I know about this where can I go to school for this mm-hmm. um, and my teacher there was like oh there's this great school called Seton Hill and I'm like how do I not know that exists <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> how do I not know that this program is there um, and then for those of you do- who don't know Seton Hill is very close to it's, where we are. Yes, yes. It would it would be one of the very closest schools I could have gone to. Um, and so I ended up transferring in uh, January of that year. I just was like, okay, Seton Hill, I'm accepted. I'm going. We're doing this. So I just moved home mm-hmm. and um, went to my classes there and started at Seton Hill and doing art, studio art, art therapy. And then I, I ended up graduating from Seton Hill with um, – a bachelor's in studio art and then just decided to stay on and go for art therapy in the grad program because you can't practice until you have a graduate degree and Mm -hmm. licensure and everything anyway so yeah that's that was the first round of school i feel (laughs) like first and second um because didn't you go to savannah college of art and design also yes i was crazy. (laughs) um, I was doing photography and also studying art therapy at the graduate level. And I was working doing photography for myself. And I was like, you know, I grew up with dark rooms. I grew up with film and I don't know a whole lot about digital photography and printing. And printing was the big one for me, like the Mm -hmm. output of printing and feeling like I wanted to do this and I wanted to do it right. Um, And so I ended up applying online to do a second grad program online from Savannah College of Art and Design. So they had, because they had an an all online course, but of course there were prerequisites I couldn't take. (laughs) So I ended up um, just asking my husband, I was like, so how do you feel about moving to Savannah? And he was like, okay. So I was like, all right, we'll <laughs> that go. That was easy. Yeah. It was like, okay, let's go. So I ended up, I took, talked to uh, the dean at the art therapy department and she was sad that I was going to take some time off, but um, yes, take some time off. I'm not sure if I'm done <laughs> yet. <it>. So, <laughs> uh, but I just decided, I was like, okay, I, I need to do this. And um, I was just re- always really happy with a camera in my hands. And my husband was like, yeah, you you're struggling right now with writing all these research papers constantly and it's a lot on you. So like going into photography made sense. So I just picked up and moved to Savannah. That was the easiest option, I guess. I think it's also (laughs) interesting to point out that when you did this, it was relatively new um, because they didn't really have an extensive digital program before that. So you're kind of, were, you know, a pioneer in the um, kind of educational realm in regards to that. Yeah, it it was definitely something that um, a lot of the people that I was in the class with, a lot of them were adults who had been doing photography already, but then realized, like, we need to learn the digital process. Yeah, and you know, so obviously you were doing it in a specialized art school where you had to yeah. move to do it. So it wasn't yeah. widespread. <laughs> right. Well, definitely not. I think a lot of people were, were buying digital cameras. A lot of photographers mm-hmm. were shooting with digital cameras. They were, had become more affordable than, than previously, but I would say probably for like maybe four years or so at that point, um, that most photographers were like, Oh yeah, I got to shoot digital now. Mm-hmm. But to know about it, I don't think right. that they really understood how everything translates. And, and then 
how to print is so different? Well, I think um, because you um, are on that cusp, you still um, frame things the same way. Because I feel like I remember, and I was never a professional photographer, but you never wanted to waste your film Um, so you would frame things first and then you would make it right first and then take the shot as opposed to taking a hundred pictures of the same one and hoping that one of those worked out right right our generation was one that got caught in between we got we've seen the the analog and we've been moved into the digital so i think did that influence you Yes. And I was thinking about this too, whenever we were talking about the exposure to art in this mm-hmm. area, we didn't have the internet. No. So no. I, <laughs> that would have <laughs> changed things time, tremendously. Yeah. Like I remember my mom took a trip to New York and she came back and was telling me about things and I had to like imagine them because <laughs> mm-hmm. there was no internet. No. And so I, the information now that is accessible too to learn this stuff wasn't all there whenever right. I was in school either. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like you could just learn digital photography from the internet. You had to hope it was in the encyclopedia that was already 10 <laughs> years old sitting on your shelf. Yes, yes, there was no <laughs> access to that. And and I think that I still enjoy shooting film. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something I... In grad school, when my camera was stolen, my apartment was broken into finals week, and my camera was oh, stolen, nice. my laptop was stolen. In Savannah? Back everything <laughs> up twice, people. Like, this is the, this is the law of, of digital photography is back it up twice because, yeah, I had a copy. It wasn't my most recent, like, the stuff I had just done that, that day, but mm-hmm. I had everything else backed up. And so I just – I was heartbroken, picked up my – my Holga, like, (laughs) you know, my little film camera. And I'm like, I'm going to go to the beach. And I just went and like shot pictures of sticks and water. And like, that's just, that's what I go back to, you know, every time I, I don't get the same feeling from taking pictures digitally. I don't think it's just like driving around and randomly just finding beautiful things to take pictures of with a film camera. Uh, I think it translates in your digital work, though. I mean, there you have a wonderful way of adding texture and uh, a quality of light that um, isn't always apparent in digital photography. So I think you do well to add that, you know, from your experience. But speaking of funny things with the Internet, that's actually how we met. Yes, it is. That's, that's, I tell this story a lot. Um, people are like strangers on the internet. And I'm like, oh my God, I love Twitter. Do you know why? I love Twitter because you hit. How long were you here before I messaged you? Um, maybe about a year. Twitter was new, though. It was still early. I didn't really use it very much. I, I you know... Facebook even was still was not a thing then as no. much. I mean, no. that was still with the schools. And, and Do we know what year this was? Um, a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was. Um, but I, I know that Twitter was newer. And, and I will remind people that Twitter used to be a text-based... <laughs> Text only. based only, so you would you would text this number and then it would tweet your text out to everybody that followed like you, and mm-hmm. it was it was a completely different bird than it is now, <laughs> I guess. But um, there was a tool that you could go online when they started to put some of it online, and, and there was this tool that you could look up people around you, and I was like, whoa, there's somebody in Bolivar, <laughs> Pennsylvania, that has under their like their bio that they're an artist and I don't know them. So I'm just like, Hey, you're an artist. I'm, we got to go back and look up those tweets now. But I'm just, it's pretty much like, I'm an artist. You're an artist. We need to hang out. Let's get lunch. And we did. And that's what happened. <laughs> we've been friends ever since. Yes. So Twitter is a wonderful, wonderful thing for that. The internet can bring people together. And I'm grateful for that in this living in this region. Oh, oh yeah. That. Community. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, because there, I mean, there are things around here and it's becoming more accessible, but it's not like a city. No. Well, I think mm-hmm. even in the last few years, I mean, there are all these creative people in this area, 
but they all kind of didn't know that one another was out there. And so things like the Ligonier Art Walk um, became real from the internet. I mean, the physical stores were all here to begin with, but it wasn't until we started uh, reaching outside of our communities to engage other people who were interested in creative processes that this actually became a thing. Well, so. and many artists are introverts, but we're online. So yeah. <laughs> you can reach out and find those local artists that you couldn't before. Introverts unite. So <laughs> right. in <your> own house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and at the art walk. That's right. And yes. at the and art make walk. sure you come here. Yes. So you talked a little bit about um, uh, photographing nature and sticks and beach scenes. <laughs> and what are some of your biggest inspirations right now? Right now, oh gosh. Um, and whether that's inspiration by internet or real world. Yeah. Oh, I am, I've been listening to a lot of art podcasts because they're so readily available. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the Art for Your Ear podcast, uh, Danielle Carissa, who is the Jealous Curator, does that. And her artwork, she does collage um, okay. and painting. And something Andrew knows a little bit about. <laughs> <laughs> and and I I really I love her work. I love her podcasts and her personality and the way it comes through. And so every single artist that she interviews, I'm like looking them up. And I'm so like I'm like, wow, they're just, just amazing. Like she finds these amazing artists and, and interviews them. And so I've I've gotten um, quite a few of those recently that I have been inspired by. Um, and then on Instagram, there are also a lot of artists, a lot of abstract painters mm -hmm. that share their work that way. Um, one of which, uh, I found this woman, Wendy McWilliams, who like pulled okay. all her work from galleries and just started selling it on Instagram. And mm -hmm. she's usually successful. That's and, amazing. And I yeah. think, I mean, once again, it's her personality. It's her connection with people. Right. And her work is beautiful, which, you know, it, that's, that, <laughs> that helps. helps. <laughs> it really helps. It does. Um, yeah. And, and the I've met some other artists through following these people that are – that are also inspiring me right now. Uh, Wendy Brightbill does like florals and I, I don't know why I have been so drawn to incredibly feminine things whenever typically like I would like to sit down and draw like paint in all black. Like I feel like, <laughs> I feel like that is very me, but then I sit down and like these like pink flowers come colors out, come out. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So, <laughs> but I just end up, I end up doing that. And those are the pieces that I, that I really feel. Um, there's a lot of color in the, in the artists that I'm inspired by right now. Um, Liz Tran does these like, they're like, look like paper lanterns and they are splotches of color everywhere. And sometimes they're like pieces of color outside or in a building or a huge installation of hundreds of them hanging. Okay. Um, and she was doing some protest pieces too, because I'm always... If an artist has like political motivations there that are moving them towards like equality mm -hmm. um, and to make pieces about it, I, I'm always struck in my heart by those pieces, yeah. regardless of how they look. And listeners, we will try to link um, all of these bios on our website under the podcast section for you so you can take a look as well. Yeah. 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 That <laughs> me. I, I would love if other people would follow these people too. Um, yeah, Liz Tran did a piece. It was just like the Lord's like, no. And it was like, very powerful. And she just right. keeps like, just no. Like, that's a response. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, scrolling through Instagram and seeing everything that's going on in the world currently. And, you know, just, just seeing this like I bright love how these Twitter and Instagram, it is so current. It's right now. It's what's happening it's not, you're not waiting a week for the news. You're not even waiting a day for the news. It's a zeitgeist. Yeah. I think my, I'm so moved by these artists too, because it is right now. And I do get to see their work right now. And like, you know, going back to growing up and not having any access, that instant access right. to artists who are creating work in response to what's happening immediately. Right. We read books about things that were published yeah. <laughs> years and years ago. We didn't have that. Yeah. So you're, you're now able to be up to the moment and not and up to the last 10 years. You're up to the last second now. 
Well, feminist also- art? Yeah, that's not even written about. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's not. It's, it's surprising how feminist art is is such a now thing, but it's been around for our, you know a long time. And, but it's now like with the Brooklyn Museum having their own wing with the Judy Chicago plates mm-hmm. and um, but also small towns are involved in that now because you can see it it's it's there you have access to it whereas before the movements were contained more to larger cities and where they could exert the most influence that makes sense from the you know from the standpoint of what they are too. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I learned a lot about that. Like it was never something that I had heard much of until I got to Seton Hill, which was right up until I went, it was an all women's college. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was newly co-ed. There were like four guys when I started and they were all artists. It was before they started recruiting for sports. So (laughs) it was very different than it is right Mm now. Um, but Maureen Vissot is, was, was one of, the teachers I had for I think almost all of my art history and okay. she it was just fantastic with relaying these stories about women and showing their places within the traditional history of art um you know and and I feel like she probably had to dig to learn the stuff that she knew right and, oh definitely and, and to have these stories of women and how they were you know they were assistants or, or anonymous yeah and they they didn't or their work was just you know, Not stolen. Credited. Yeah. So, um, knowing all of that, I, I found like, I, I found, I really found that I was drawn to, um, like all of the, the feminist artists that we learned about. And I believe I did a report on them too. When <laughs> for, for that somewhere class, one like, time somewhere, ago. Somewhere, <laughs> yeah. I believe I spoke about, about them. Because um, we all remember every report we ever did, right? No, it was, it, it was, <laughs> I read through reports and like, boy, no. I knew a lot back then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was really meaningful though to finally be like, oh, these are women artists. And so mm-hmm. now I find it's interesting that like a lot of the artists on the podcast that I mentioned are women and a lot of the um, a lot of the artists on Instagram and I don't know if it's because maybe there are more women on Instagram. I'm not sure. I know that Pinterest, the statistics, there were a lot more women Mm -hmm. on Pinterest than men. But I'm curious about that if there just aren't as many male artists on Pinterest and on Instagram as there are. I don't don't know. know. I think that, like, my feed is pretty split down the middle. But I think you've hit on a really interesting point where these new creative communities that are technology-based are giving a platform where women artists, where minority artists, where people who might have been kind of swept under the rug are finally, you know, given a platform where their voices and creativity can be heard. And they can yeah. find not only each other, but their audience and a, and a larger audience. Yeah. I think that touches on another thing where not only is it instantaneous, but there's also interaction. So if you see somebody who is like you and they're of your tribe, your your kindred spirit, you can reach out and connect to them. Which before, you know, you were in your studio all by yourself <laughs> and hopefully you met some cool people at your art show. And <laughs> yeah. 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 But speaking of the the feminism and the background, um, you know, when you look at your pieces, it would be easy to say, oh, color, line, shape, but there's something more. And I think that that, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about the more? Yeah, <laughs> um, more on the more. Um, well, going back to when I was at Seton Hill, uh studying um for in studio art and i had a women in religion class and it was about there was something about uh emptiness and not connecting to the religion as a woman and i it struck a chord with me and i was started to use that in my painting and i started to look into like ideas of prayer and of um meditation as being the same and really looking into ideas about energy and the influence that has on us. And um, 
really that it came to the work that I have now came from that out of that and is about holding space and my all of the pieces that are that are up here now are part of the work I've been doing where a couple years ago I had gone through a really tough time and kind of didn't know how to start back up again I didn't feel comfortable just picking up my camera and the same way that I had before and I kind of turned back to painting um I worked with my physical therapist, my occupational therapist, um, to really figure out, because I had been really sick, and so physically doing the work had had become very difficult. Um, so we worked on how I could start painting again and set up everything I needed, and I started holding that space for myself. I thought, okay, here's what I'm going to do. This is going to be my goal. I'm going to start really simple. I'm going to put paint on paper. Like that was literally it. That was all I expected of myself. And I started to do that every day. I would just have everything already set up, walk into the room and make, you know, I was working through a lot too. So mm -hmm. as it all started to come out, it started to make more sense. And I was like, okay, these are actual, like the shapes that I'm making and the colors I'm using, they're reflective of every, not just everything I'm feeling, but they're holding space in and of themselves. There's like this shape that's like a crescent moon or, you know, it's very womb-like, it's very bowl-like and it's, you know, and then there the hollows are another thing that I've always done. Those are also about space and holding space and being open and allowing things to come in and to go. Um, well, it's interesting that you say allowing because it sounds like you've given yourself permission and that's a, it's a powerful, you know, a gift to yourself to recognize that there's, you know, there's more and you're willing to open yourself up to more. Because like you were saying, there's these archetypes that, that you're starting to see um, filter through your work and you're working with these, you know, iconic symbols and they're, it's, I want to say it's more than sub like subconscious because you're, you know, you're aware of these things, which is um, a really amazing gift to be able to, to use those tools to tell your story. And it's funny because you would think that I would be aware of it, <laughs> but like I was just sitting down to paint and, and really going at it with the same, um, the same mentality of trying to meditate. And, you know, everybody is like, oh, like, meditation is hard you try to not think anything but that's mm -hmm. not really what it is it's more just accepting what's happening and what comes and goes letting and, it flow through yes yeah. yes exactly and so, so I was trying to do as I was painting and things would come especially if something just happened within like either in my own life or outwardly in you know in our country, something, and I would be very upset about and have all these feelings about, and they would come out. And, you know, whether it was color or the, the texture of the paint, the way it's going down. Um, but it took me like six months of painting the same shape. So like, <laughs> till I really sat down and put the pieces together and was looking at them. And I was like, okay, I've done 40 paintings and I didn't think I did that many. And wow, this shape has shown up a lot. And then I'm like Googling. <laughs> Clearly I love technology. In case you right? didn't get this. Yeah. Um, I'm Googling like, what are these shapes? Like looking at the backgrounds of, of that and looking up in my book. And the symbolism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all, of, all of the meanings of, of what I've been painting and not realizing I was painting. Well, uh, it's funny that even though your paintings are very different from Frida Kahlo, um, there's kind of a similarity where um, you'd mentioned you have, you know, have gone through some illnesses and some some different challenges, but using that as kind of um, a prompt to paint and explore this um, other part of your reality, which is, you know, um, very uh, influenced by your you know, your politics and your ideas about feminism and, and 
I joke, you know, I call her Saint Frida, but <laughs> Saint Frida. Um, and I actually, I made a with the with the Frida beads. Do you still mm-hmm. have them here? Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. So I love the Frida beads, and I've made multiple necklaces of them. I used a lot of purple, and um, I donated one to the Frida Center for Fibromyalgia. Um, which there's a doctor on the West Coast who runs this amazing clinic. It's a center. She has, she's a doctor with fibromyalgia. So I feel like she gets it more than anybody ever could. Mm -hmm. And she's sort of like adopted Frida. And then, so there was a whole like themed artwork thing and there were Frida necklaces. She actually made some Frida necklaces too. So we got to get her hooked up with those beads. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, So, so I think that there are a lot of people that identify with Frida Kahlo for those reasons and she is my you know if i have a saint that's her that's her (laughs) her. well she's somebody who did it before the internet who held her own space and created her own um legacy despite being you know in turbulent relationships or in um, oftentimes in the shadow of her husband who was you know Put above her in so many regards, whether it was commissions, pay, or whatever. So, I think she's kind of like, you know, the anthem bearer of today's Instagram and Pinterest artists who, you know, may not have had that before. Yeah. Yeah. You can show up to your own opening and driven by an ambulance. <laughs> no, I don't know anybody that does that these days. So. That's impressive. Yeah. Hopefully I never have to. <laughs> right. <laughs> but. Not yeah, God would, right? Yeah. Well, I was looking at your art that we have on the wall. And as a lay person, somebody who's not necessarily has a background in art or not in the artistic field, um, I see dark and I see light. And was there a progression? Is this still a mix in your life? Yeah. In how these came out. Yeah, I think that the um, they may not like if you think about that, and you might try to assume what mood I was in or what I was mm-hmm. feeling whenever I was painting darker light, but it, that's not really true. I guess I shouldn't say dark and light; <laughs> almost dark in color. I mean, there. Yeah, yeah. there, there is. Um, was I'm, there a movement? Were they mixed? I think they go through color phases. Mm-hmm. Um, and it may have to do with the seasons. It may have to do with like, and I remember dressing this way. So this was like a very <laughs> long thing. Like I would go through a color whenever I was younger and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to wear blue. I'm going to wear this blue lipstick. I'm going to wear this blue <laughs> nail polish. Like this is all blue. I'm blue. Yeah. So. <laughs> Your blue phase. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't know if I've been going through a pink phase, which is super weird for me. Like I had sworn off pink for such a long time mm-hmm. that um, just because I think I wore so much of it as a small child. <laughs> uh, I but um, I know that the coral, like there's so much coral and mm-hmm. it it just keeps popping back up. And I'm like, I don't know where it's this forcing is. forcing itself like, out. I have to like – and there are, there are color associations. I know in school for art therapy, we had to like write down all of our own color associations because there are very general ones, mm-hmm. but yours may be different. So I go back to that sometimes and reflect on them after I've painted things in certain colors. And I'm like, wow, I've been really drawn to like these corals all week um, yeah. or for two weeks or you know, they just, this, this one color just keeps popping back up. And um, with the, the Ameliora, the one on the bottom left there is uh, mm-hmm. the pink and coral. And I just keep painting that. <laughs> and and it, it comes up, I think it speaks to sensitivity, um, whether it's my own or culturally. Um, and then some of the, the darker pieces I could paint in the same week but I also will set things down and then I'm not when I'm not feeling them and then I will come back to them and spend more time with them maybe when I am feeling more so that color. You, so do you have a color cookbook? <laughs> um, you mean like a Well, when I like the work, Munsell color chart? Is that like <laughs> well, when, when I start a new body of work, what I often do is I create a new color wheel. Okay. And it sounds like you've been doing this even, you know, just by when you were saying you had you made those 40 paintings and then looked back through them and started seeing 
the patterns kind of emerge. But um, there's definitely a sense when I look at your pieces of things like becoming, like they're starting to form. There's like, you know, this amorphous color field of pastels and then these shapes are starting to emerge. And you can't tell if it's like a biomorphic reference or if it's a floral or if it's um, an outer space or a nebula, but there's definitely something's happening. And I think that that comes back to you and your kind of claiming of space. Yes. I think that all of those things <laughs> that you see in them are, are things that like the space, whether it's outer space or whether it's inner space. And I look at the connections between those and kind of see them all exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, so if you see them both in the same thing, then that's probably good because they reference both of those things. Um, a lot of them do reference growth. Um, and I think that's why they've become more botanical, but also I'm always drawn to photographing plants and, and it's really that's kind of how I started photographing too, was just photographing plants. And so I think that comes back out through the ones that look more like flowers. Um, and oftentimes though, you see the shape is the same for whether they are becoming flowers or whether they're becoming outer space or whether they're becoming a hole that's like a hole in a tree. It's still that same shape um, taking many different forms. Well, it's interesting because there is that connectivity between the micro and the macro and the influence of what one does in their studio and how that has an influence on the greater society and how, you know, what one does in their own art practices can ripple outwards. I think that I spend a lot of time um, reflecting on what is going on and I have this like deep sense of responsibility to want to do something about any injustice I learn of, which can be exhausting and it can, <laughs> it can be like really, you know, really we don't enough on ourselves. No, I right? know. Right. And, and so holding space for myself in this way has been a sort of a way of dealing with it, especially because, I'm, I have this illness that I can't really get out there and do things like I used to, you know, at least go to protests in the street. And now I'm, I can protest online. I can't really, like, I don't have the physical capacity to drive to some place and to go, it's like I used to go to DC and, you know, and to, to walk around in the streets all day and carry a sign or a petition or something like mm -hmm. that has become more difficult and out of reach for me. Um, so I remind myself that you know, self-care is, is a, is a form of, of revolution. Mm -hmm. So, um, right. you know, I, I just tell myself that and sit down and paint and hope that, you know, I hope that it could reach somebody and connect with something greater or contribute to that greater energy of healing that, you know, if this is, if this is my prayer or my meditation upon healing, that it isn't just for me. A lot of times it's for everybody and everything. And, I hope that that goes beyond my little studio room. So. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Ripples. So I guess, um, it, it, do you have, I mean, we've talked a lot, a lot about things here, but do you have any specific words of advice or words of wisdom for somebody who may be having difficulties or somebody trying to get into an artistic field and especially coming from your background with, with your body not always cooperating, what can you offer as far as advice or wisdom for people? Yeah. Um, take care of yourself. One, that is, <laughs> that is, uh, you, you know, you have to. Um, and I tried numerous times to, to just push forward and do the work, but I can't do the work unless I take care of myself. So now I have to find, you have to find balance. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> balance is, balance is hard for anybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think artists, you know, are so passionate about things that we can push really hard for what we want. Um, but don't let it be at your expense. Um, and I would say do the work. Like I know I talked a lot about Instagram and Twitter and, mm -hmm. you know, making connections with people. Um, which is especially important if you are in a rural area, 
but I, you have to do the work. You, you know, you, you don't have to go to art school. I know mm-hmm. I did. I went to a lot of schooling cause I really <laughs> needed it and I didn't have much access otherwise. But I think now with the internet being what it is, you can get on there. You can learn the things that you need to learn. You can meet people and well, there are great free classes. There are yeah, great I mean, just research yeah. that you can do now. And no student debt, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> you don't want that. Um, but part yeah. of taking care of yourself, right? <laughs> yes, it is part of taking care of yourself. Exactly. But I, I definitely think that it, just taking care of yourself, finding the balance and doing the work is, I mean, just make the art, whatever you're mm-hmm. called to do, if it's photography or if it's painting, just keep making it and don't expect a lot out of yourself. Like don't expect to just sit down and, and paint something grand. Like I remember my goal, it was to put paint on paper and <laughs> right. I, I had all that schooling and that was my, that was my goal. So I think that that's great. Don't be too hard on yourself. Right. You know? Part of it. Well, and in just before we say a, a quick goodbye here, I just wanted to ask, do you have any other activities planned or any other shows coming up that you'd like to talk about? Um, I have after tomorrow, after the art walk, <laughs> I am co-hosting the Red Tent, um, which is a women's group for a women's community. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that, where does that take place? That's going to be in Homer City at the Wise Women Natural Health Collective. Um, so if you, I will give you information for links mm-hmm. for that. If anybody wants to check it out there in the area, it's fantastic. Um, and then otherwise I'm just going to keep painting, take my dog for a walk <laughs> <laughs> and play some magic. I play magic. So okay. if there are any yeah. nerds that want to play magic with me, <laughs> I'm down with that too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And we just want to reiterate here a little bit that you can find Jen online at jenpalmer.myportfolio.com. She will also be on our website after the Art Walk debuts. We will put her artwork up along with some bonus artwork that we will have there for sale online on our website, www.allegorygallery.com.